Welcome everybody to Personal FX, the place to see some of the best collectibles. John Burke has been on vacation all this week, and joining me in the apartment, John Davis. That's right. Uh, we're entering the home stretch on the week mm -hmm. for the show. We have an interesting show today. We're going to meet this man, David Herman, who is an expert on violins, and he's going to show you how to uh, determine the value of the violin that you may have. Who knows? People at home might have a Stradivarius. Mm. Also, this is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where this weekend they will be running the Indianapolis 500. And appropriately enough, I.O. Haynes is just 10 minutes away with an auto racing super collection that's sure to get your motors running. So we've got cars, we've got music, we've got a lot happening on today's Personal FX. I'm here in the living room with a number of people who have brought in items to be appraised. This is Nancy, and, and you're kind of the head of this whole family here, right, Nancy? Yes. Yes, and these are your grandchildren. <laughs> yes. Now, yes. did you did you get them started collecting? Well, a little bit, maybe. A little bit, a little bit. Maybe it's a little, a little. Contagi <laughs> contagious, and uh, yeah. there's some heredity in there. Heredity in there. Okay, <laughs> if you want to join us in the apartment, give us a call at 1-800 fx fx fx1 and now let's go out to indianapolis indiana with io haynes who is with a collector with a really fast collection right io <laughs> john and claire on sunday 35 of the world's fastest car drivers will be racing in the indy 500 the granddaddy of all auto races now to some people it's just an event but to others like jeff dickerson our super collector it is a way of life Jeff, or better known as JD, has not missed uh -oh. one single Indy 500 race since 1970. He's dedicated. Wow. JD, thank you for having us. Thank you. Now, did you first get your pieces in your, in your collection in 1970? I actually got the first one about 1972, and it was this particular whiskey bottle ah. of Bobby Yonsers. I was helping a friend of mine deliver Pepsis, and we delivered them to a liquor store. I seen that. I fell in love with it. And as payment for helping him that day, he bought me that car, and that's what got the whole ball of wax going. That's great, and it's not just a decanter, it actually moves. Yeah, this one will actually roll, as compared to some of the other ones that will not roll. Now, you didn't take any of that liquor out of it, did you? No. <laughs> it's still in there. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to look at some of his 750 auto racing memorabilia here in Indiana. Okay, thank you, Io. Thank you, JD. Uh-oh, it's going to be a confusing show. We have two JDs on the show. Well, right now, let's go over to Claire, Jerry, Judith, and, of course, Andy. Okay, hi, Andy. Welcome. Where are you from? Saginaw, Michigan. And what brings you to New York? We are here for a wedding. Uh, as you can see, we have our whole clan here, and uh, my wife's stepbrother's getting married. And How lovely. Well, we're glad we're part of your wedding plans. Well, thank you. We're you excited have an item to be appraised. Let me introduce you to two of our ace appraisers, Jerry Harrelson and Judith Katschor. It's good to Hi. see you guys. Good to see no you. No wedding yeah. plans this weekend for you? Not for me, no. <laughs> <laughs> you brought in something very lovely. Tell us about it. Actually, this was a housewarming gift um, from my wife's Aunt Gloria. It is a uh, silver tea set that we... Um, that we think is really just lovely. Um, it was a housewarming gift about oh, a couple of years ago. Why don't you pass it along? I surely and will. Is there a marking on it that we should know about? Um, not anything really that, that that I see. Well, there's something that I see. This says Pear Point Manufacturing Company, and this name was changed around 1910 when they just became the Pear Point Company. They're from Massachusetts, and nowadays they produce glass. So. They're not making these anymore, and this is an early 20th century set. And they started off as coffin fitting makers uh, in the early 1800s. And they joined forces with their neighbors, Mount Washington uh, Glass Company. And they made beautiful, beautiful lamps from like 19, maybe early 1900s through 1930s, reverse painting glass shapes and beautiful metal bottoms. And this too was one of their lines, the silver plated. This is triples silver plated, as a matter of fact. Triple silver plated, yes. which means they did it three, three times. times. Three How layers. valuable is something like this? Uh, the fact that it's PR point, it is an absolutely exquisite mm -hmm. condition. I would say about 150 to 175 for the set. This is perfect, the set. Mm -hmm. I would say 150 to 200 for this. Well, it was a perfect housewarming gift. Now we need to know whether you'd like to put it up for sale or not. 
I sure would. We'll be happy to do that. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy your wedding. Thank you. And our number to call for any or all items that are up for sale throughout the show is 212-802-0082. And Tracy joins us next. Hi, Tracy. Hi, how are you? What do you collect? Um, Smurfs. Oh, and you brought some. Yeah. How many do you have? I have 86. What do you like about Smurfs? Well, when I was little, I liked them. I just, I just started collecting them when they first came out. How nice. It brings back some good memories yeah. as well. I have a little gardening Smurf here. Oh, you have a little space Smurf? <laughs> These are real cute. They're, they're from the 70s. Uh, they obviously have a lovely impact on people. Well, yeah, they're, yeah. it's everybody's it's childhood little mm -hmm. character, you know. Mm -hmm. They made them in many, many, many different uh, varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, one for every occupation you could think of or anything Holiday. you might want to do. They actually started in Belgium. Most of hers were made in West Germany, mm -hmm. uh, and many of them were made in Hong Kong. They are very collectible. And as quiet as is kept, many of them sell for 3 to $5, some of them sell for fifty and sixty dollars if you get a really. Do they start out at the three to five dollar range? They or? start out as a dollar, mm -hmm. two dollar range actually. But as collectibles, um, they made them up until very recently. They may still be making them, and the newer ones are, le are valued less. But some of these early ones, and they're dated, mm -hmm. are valued at much more. So the fifty, sixty dollar ones are just the older ones. Older ones, what do we unusual have ones. Here? Well, I think the yeah. majority of these are. Um, made in the late 70s, mm -hmm. and I would value them at between 2 and $4 a piece, but I think that they're going to go up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for her collection here of her 86, mm -hmm. you've got about a $300 worth of uh, Smurfs. Okay. And mm -hmm. I would say it's more like 175 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In that range, you have 86. Right. You were thinking about putting them all up mm -hmm. for sale? Yes, I was. We'll do that for you. Okay, thank, thank you so much for thank visiting. Thank you. And next is Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, how Good are you? Good to have you with us. Oh, it's a pretty vase. Where did you get it? Um, actually, my aunt, um, when I was younger, yes. uh, I used to go with her to garage sales, mm -hmm. and she picked that up. Oh, so you remember the day she bought it? No, no, I don't remember yeah. that particular piece. I just remember going to garage sales mm -hmm. or antique shops there. Yes. It has an incised mark on the bottom that says Weller. Mm -hmm. This is made by the Weller Pottery Company of Zanesville, Ohio. And they didn't start making artwares until about 1897, and then they were gone by 1948. Mm -hmm. So you have a 50-year span in which to date this, and it's more than likely a 20th century piece. And although I'm not famous with, fav I am not familiar with all of their different lines, so that I couldn't put a name to this one, I'll tell you it's very pretty. It has irises on it, and it's got a crackle, matte crackle glaze. It's matte. But certain Weller pieces are more valuable than other. Yes, their Dickens line what? is very, very valuable. It's mm -hmm. a particular line. Some of the artist sign pieces are very mm -hmm. valuable. Usually the pieces like this without an artist sign, mm -hmm. without any particular um, um, scenes or anything mm -hmm. on it, just the floral sign. This piece I would think is worth about $225. Well, I'm going to go a little bit better. Although it's not Luelsa, which is the most famous mm -hmm. Weller line, it's very attractive and it, it does have an interesting glaze in that it's matte and also crackled. So I'm going to say three to five hundred for this. Up to three five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. mm, you're smiling. Does that mean you'd like to put it up for sale? Certainly. Yes. But chances are your aunt may have paid less for it when she went out shopping. Um, we'll be happy to put it up for sale for you. Are you part? Are you part of the wedding? Yes. I hope the wedding goes great well, this. Yes. Okay. Go with this great this weekend. And let's toss it over to John Davis and some beautiful violins. That's right, they are beautiful, Claire. We're over here with David Herman, who is a violin restorer as well as dealer. Now, most people think that when it comes to violins, if you have an older violin, it's always going to be more valuable than a contemporary one. Is well, that true? No, that's not true. For example, we have a violin here by Joseph Klotz of 1762, mm -hmm. uh, valued at about eight to $9,000. And we have a violin here by Thomas Batuka, uh, 1956, valued at about $15,000. Wow, so why is that one so much more valuable than this one? Well, this is a contemporary violin made for the needs of a modern soloist, and the design of this instrument is more sought out after for its usage in the concert hall. That's great. All right, later on in the show, we're going to learn a lot more from David about violins. But right now, let's go out to Indianapolis, Indiana, where Nanette has an item she'd like to have appraised. Nanette, what did you bring for us today? Uh, I'm going to have my Larry Bird cutout appraised coming up next on Personal FX. The FX out for the Daytime Emmys, and he won last night. Actually, he was nominated for Outstanding Performance for an Animated Program for Life with Louie. And J.D., last year, 
we had on his super collection of smoking memorabilia. Now, he thinks smoking is going to be outlawed in a little while, and his collection is going to be hot, hot, hot. Definitely. It yeah. seems like a lot of the smoking memorabilia is going up. We, yeah. We've been seeing a lot of it on the show today, or uh, on the show recently, don't I you think? I think it makes people feel wicked. Wicked. It's a wicked thing. <laughs> All right, we're here with Judith Katz Schwartz and Jerry Harrelson, and let's go out to Indianapolis, Indiana with Nanette, who has a uh, Larry, a very big Larry bird cut out. <laughs> Hi, Nanette. Hello. Tell us about your, your cutout. Uh, well, I found it uh, at an estate sale I was at last Saturday, and he caught my eye because uh, Larry's our new coach here with the Pacers in Indianapolis. Oh, that's, nice. that's great. Can we ask how much you paid for it, or don't you want to reveal that? <laughs> I'm going to keep that a secret <laughs> for now <laughs> until right, I Judith. get the appraisal. Well, this was certainly a means by which any boy can see how he measures up mm -hmm. the Larry Bird. Um, it's a mass-produced item, though, and um, it's something that was widely bought in its day. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how rare they are. Even though they are made of cardboard and that makes them perishable, I think there may still be a few around. I agree, Judith. They were bought in large quantities. They were widely distributed, and uh, they still make them. They're the kind of things you go to any mall at a show, a collectible show, or a sports store, they have them. I think what she might want to do is drag it to a game and hope to get a signature, and that ah, would increase his value. That really mm -hmm. Now, will it be more valuable in Indianapolis because of his association with the team there? Yes, Certainly, yeah. for the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what kind of a value would you place this on it? This is like 1980s, I think, late 1980s, this particular one, and at the time they sold for maybe about $12. So maybe 15 or 18, because although you can get recent ones, you may not be able to find this particular one in good shape. Wow, okay. 15 to 25. Wow, 15 to 25 dollars. Would you like to hold on to it, or would you like to entertain some offers? I, I would like some offers. I think it'd be fun to see if people are interested. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to bid on that item, give us a call at 212. 802-0082, and now we have Mary. How are you, Mary? Hi. Welcome to the show. Hi. Tell us about your uh, the dishes that you brought here. Okay, these were dishes I found in my mother-in-law's attic. Uh, we were thinking of using them. Uh, they were never used. It's a complete set of 60 uh, pieces for the uh, dishes. Mm -hmm. And we also have silverware here, a complete set of, I believe, 54. I just have no idea what it, you know, what it would be valued at. I'd like you to just give it a look and well, see. Well, good. So you come to the right place. We're yeah. talking about <laughs> service for eight, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Plus the serving pieces. Why don't we start with this? This, this is a little certificate that came in the box of flatware, and it says, Meriden Silver Plate, Meriden, Connecticut. Now, the reason I mention that is because wait, we're looking for a piece with a mark on it here. That's a different manufacturer from the people who made the dinner plates. We made the whole set of plates. And the idea was, it's called a homemaker set. So what they would do is, you'd give this to a bride and it would be everything she needed. The plates, the silverware, everything she needed. Okay, and this company is one of the Zanesville, Ohio potteries, Taylor, Smith & Taylor. They're still in business. Um, their most famous line is the Lou Ray pastels. But this is kind of a later thing. This is probably from the 50s. Yeah, I think so. Very pretty. Um, this is what you call an undervalued set. In other words, it hasn't caught on as a collectible item yet. Mm -hmm. But because you have the whole set and because it's in such good condition, it's a really good find. Okay. How good of a find? <laughs> We're talking about 125 to 150 dollars for everything. For everything. Silverware as mm -hmm. well as okay. Well, I think considering you have all the serving pieces and the original box and the packing has even been removed. You can probably do a little bit better, and I'd say upwards of $200 for the whole thing. Okay, okay, so we're hearing up to $200. Are you going to hold on to it, or would you like to take some sit, take some bids? Take some bids. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. And now we have Alicia, who is coming in here. Ed's going to help carry this Absolutely. stuff off. Don't forget your certificate. Take your certificate, Ed. <laughs> thank you very much. And then we have Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Hi. And you have an, this is an inkwell? Yes. Tell us about it. Where'd you get it? Um, I got it from my great aunt. She was a teacher, and she passed it down to me. Great. Okay. Do you know how long she had had it? Um, I'm not really sure. Okay. What this do you think, Jerry? This is just the kind of thing a teacher would have. I mean, <laughs> something that has to do with writing. And in the 18th century, when education and literacy became widely, um, uh, widely, uh, wide in our area. You think you were having yeah, trouble. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a new time. Um, 
Inkwells became very popular because dip pens became very popular. They made them in all kinds of materials, all shapes, and all kinds of designs, not only for the home, but also for the office. And this one is really quite lovely. Judy found something very interesting about it, though, when she was looking at it. I only let her call me Judy. I just wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Judith. <laughs> um, I just want to say that there were inkwells in ancient times, but um, Jerry's absolutely right. In the 18th century, suddenly literacy hit the population, and everyone could read and write, and that's when the manufacture of them really blossomed. What I've noticed is that there's a little, little piece of inlaid wood in here. Um, apparently, some of the brass was left raised, and the wood was carved around it, and that's a very interesting detail, that it's not just a plain brass tray. Does it help you date it? doesn't help me. I would say what helps me date it is the total design. This is Art Nouveau design, so this is the first quarter of the 20th century, and I'm going to say it's in perfect shape, no chips or anything, and its value should be somewhere around $200. Yes, I agree, about $175 to $200. All right. right, what do you think? Would you like to hold on to it, or would you like to entertain some offers? Um, take some offers. I'll You'll take some offers? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you. And now we have... Nancy, who is Alicia's grandmother, coming in with a cigarette yeah. case. Mm -hmm. Claire's smoking items. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this, Nancy. I don't wow. really know anything much about it, but when we cleaned out my mother's house, we found it. Wow, and that's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, when I looked on the outside, I loved it. But when I looked on the inside, forget about it. Is it rare to see designs <laughs> it's like that very inside? very rare to see the design like that inside. You sometimes see them on one side, but not on the other. It's mm -hmm. very rare to see a four-panel design, front, back, and both interior sides. Wow. It's intricate work. It's very detailed. And I don't think it was the kind of thing that was made for export. That's why I had asked you, was someone in the service? It's the kind of thing that was made and purchased, I think, in Japan itself. It's absolutely exquisite. Well, it, it's meant to look like cloisonné, but it's not mm -hmm. exactly. The, the colors have been painted on, as opposed to being fired on, where you put glass between these metal strips. So it's not exactly cloisonné, but it's very beautifully done. And you will notice that the inside designs are the backs of the outside designs. So somebody went to a lot of trouble to paint them to match. Uh, quite attractive, very sophisticated. Here's a little chain that holds the cigarettes yeah, in place. Great. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't get into too much trouble because you can only fit about eight cigarettes in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say it should fetch about $100. I, 150 to 200 is very unusual in the tobacco Anna area as we were talking about cigarette collecting in general is taking a turn up these days. This is really a work of art. So we're hearing one to two hundred dollars. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think Nancy? Are you going to hold on to it or would you like to entertain some offers? I'll entertain some offers. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. And now we Thank go you. out to Indianapolis to I.O. Haynes, who's with the Super Collector with a really racy collection. John and Claire, back in 1911, the first Indy 500 race was won by Ray Haroon in a car similar to this. Now, he was only able to achieve speeds of 74 miles an hour, and I think I even drive faster than that. <laughs> but since then, there have been changes in aerodynamics and designs of cars. So the 1996 car looked very much like this wow. and was driven by Bud and Lazier. Now, he was able to achieve an average of 160 miles per hour throughout the entire course of the race. When we come back, we're looking at Indy 500 memorabilia on Personal FX. IndyCar in 12.5 hours. That's an average of 223.6 miles per hour, totaling 2,795 miles. And that time is only good if you hit all green lights. <laughs> we, we just want you to know that. I've Red done, lights, you won't make that time. Wait a minute, I've done the plane, I've done the train, but I've never done the IndyCar. Well, there's something new for it. you. Yes. <laughs> Let's tell you about the items that are up for sale, starting out with the Pear Point Sugar and Creamer that have been appraised at $150 to $200 from the early 20th century. And it is triple plated silver. They did that three times, J.D. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Smurf figures. What you're seeing is a sampling. Our guest has 86 Smurfs. For all of them, be worth $175 to $300. They're very collectible. And the Weller vase has been appraised at $225 to $500. It's from the early 20th century. It has a crackle glaze and the iris pattern. We also have the uh, Larry Bird Cutout, which is uh, in Indianapolis, valued at between $15 and $25. Mass-produced, made of cardboard from the late 80s. I have a feeling it'll go for something more than that. Somebody I do, will too. That I, do. I think there are more, yeah. more die-hard Larry Bird <laughs> right. fans out there. Uh, we also have the Homemaker set here in the apartment from $125 to $200, made by Taylor Smith & Taylor. 
1950 service for eight, 60 total pieces. Mm -hmm. We also have the brass inkwell, which is, has inlaid wood, early, early 20th century, great shape, $175 to $200. That's an interesting piece. It really okay. is. It's, mm -hmm. it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Louis Anderson, if you're watching, <laughs> we have this uh, cigarette case, which is highly detailed. It's painted. Japanese, it's beautiful, valued at between $100 and $200. Well, for those who collect smoking collectibles, it's lovely. Yeah, it's really great. When she opened it, it was mm -hmm. like, wow. Let's give you our telephone number, just in case you weren't a bid. 212-802-0082. I'm impressed by how fast those indie cars go. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> and we're going to go out to Indianapolis right now with I.O. Haynes, who's with a super collector who's actually involved in the race this weekend. He is. J.D. works behind the scenes for ABC as a chief spotter. Now, I have no idea what a chief spotter is, so I'm going to ask you, what is that? Well, I'm in the truck with the director, and I'm his extra set of eyes. As he's cutting something on the racetrack, I'm looking for the next best thing that may happen on the racetrack so that he has a forewarning of what may happen. Now, since you work so closely with the racers, do you get a few items that normal people would never be able to get? Yeah, I have uh, a lot of luck in that by working with the announcers and the drivers. Like uh, some of the announcers, Jack Aroot and Gary Gerald, I was able to obtain Jack Aroot's fire suit. This is the one that he wore last year during the 1996 Indianapolis 500 broadcast. So no matter if you're just an announcer or a racer, you have to have one of these suits on on the, on the field. Yeah, everyone who's in what they call the hot pits must wear a fire suit because fire is a big safety issue there. And, and look at this, John and Claire. Warning, auto racing is hazardous. <laughs> As if we didn't know that already. Right. <laughs> yeah, quite dangerous. Now, how long ago were you actually racing, or sorry, working there because you were a youngster going from 1970 to the races. When did you start working there? I actually started working there in about 1987. Uh, was my first time to work, but I've been going to Indianapolis since 1970. Who was your favorite racer back then? Back then it was Mario Andretti of because course. he had just won the year before and I remember clinging to the chain link fence wanting to see Mario Andretti. Now is this his visor? Yeah, that visor was actually used by Mario Andretti at a test in Laguna Seca. Oh, wow. This is cool. <laughs> now, it seems to have a few specks and stuff on it. Is that normal? Yeah, that's normal because uh, they're exposed to all the wind and, and elements out in the car. Even if it rains, they're going to get wet, and that's little sand pebbles that right. are uh, hitting the visor. You probably don't want a whole lot of those pebbles hitting no. the visor. No. You have some great signatures. Mario signed it for you. Got Mario to sign the, uh, the visor for me, and his son, Michael, who is now an active cart driver also signed up for me. Now, today, who's your favorite race racer? I would have to say that today, my favorite ex-driver would be A.J. Foyt. A.J. Foyt has been my hero, and mm. I dedicated a whole case to A.J. That is <laughs> fantastic. Now, what about this piece right here? It looks that, like from an actual was, car. That was an actual wing off of A.J. Foyt's car. It was a little small left front wing off of his car from the Miami Tamiami Park race. Goodness. At the start of the race, the green flag dropped, and I was the spotter at camera one. There was a gigantic accident. Once I covered my head and waiting for all the debris to fall out of the sky, I looked back up, and that wing was laying at my feet. So this is a piece that almost took your life. Well, I don't know about taking my life, but <laughs> well, it sure it got my attention. Your head. <laughs> it sure got my attention. Wow, an actual car part. <laughs> Yep. That is fantastic. What's your favorite piece in the collection? I would have to say my favorite piece would be this rear wing from Emerson Fittipaldi's car from the Another Michigan 500. Piece of a car. Yeah, this was uh, a wing that was on his car at Michigan, and it was involved in a first lap, first turn accident with wow. Greg Moore. As you can see in the picture, in the fireball, there's the little piece of wing wow. that is right here. It doesn't look very little right here. No, it's not very little, but it's... Uh, very strong and does a good job. And I, I like this piece primarily because this race was probably Emerson Fittipaldi's last competitive race. He was a two-time world champion, right. two-time Indy 500 champion, and this is the rear wing from probably his very last race. Well, and it's a shame that in the first turn of the first part of the race, he had to crash. After doing all that work. What is your most unique piece, as if I don't already know? <laughs> I think the most unique piece is the table, which yeah. is an actual IndyCar tire and wheel that was used <laughs> by Al Unser Sr. over at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1981 during some practice time. Excellent. 
Now, did, did it just fall off, or no, did, did they, it land they at your feet again? The stands, no, it was you? one of the situations where the uh, evolution of the new cars that you were talking about, mm -hmm. new equipment, this stuff becomes outdated, and they've got nothing to do with it, and I happen to be there. Hey, Claire and John, I think we should bring a tire back and put it in the living room somewhere at the studio, don't you think? Yeah, Good we, idea. we can use a new coffee table. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so That's what I use it for. Hey, J.D., do you have any pieces from any of the racers coming up in, on Sunday? As a matter of fact, I do. This Sunday, Ari Leyendijk, who is the pole sitter, was gracious enough to donate this piece. Well, not wow. really donate it, but this is the main gear shaft out of his car that he run in Nazareth in 1991. And it's not light. It's about it's, 20 pounds. Yeah, huh? it's very heavy. It's very heavy. And as you can see, as strong as it is, it just actually broke that shaft in half. Wow. So on impact accidents with the wall, there's a, a substantial... A metal car becomes like a toy. Absolutely. Who do you think is going to win real quick? I think uh, I'm going to have to go with Robbie Buell this year. All right. I don't know why. Why? Let's ask why. Well, I think Robbie Buell is a past uh, Indy Lights champion. Uh, talking to the young man, he's got a good head on his shoulders. and I just like Robbie. Okay. J.D. says the winner is going to be Robbie this Sunday. We're going right. to check it out. That's the prediction. Now, let me ask you, how did the driver uh, make it through the accident where you got the wing? Oh, Emerson Fittipaldi, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he had a cracked vertebrae in his neck, and I mean, they took him out on the stretcher, of course, to the hospital, and he had uh, a couple of surgeries following that, but uh, he's doing fine now, but he's just not going to be able to drive. Wow, looks like a nasty wreck. Thank you very Thank much, you. Io. Thank you very You're much, J.D. Thank you. Wow. What an interesting job that he has, <laughs> spotting for the director the next action. It's, it's a dangerous yeah. Uh, yeah. sport to watch, I imagine. With but things the people who do it love it. They do. Mm -hmm. They're diehard fans. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk with a man who, you may have a, a violin at home that mm -hmm. maybe was handed down through, through the generations. Well, we're going to have a man who will help you determine uh, how authentic your violin may be. It's all coming up next on Personal FX. Interesting item. What do you call it? Uh, wall sconces. Well, I know that. Where did you get something like this? It's is been it... in our family for years. Um, I'm on the wall? Not... Well, it's been in a couple of different houses. It's sort of been passed on from generation to generation. I have never seen something quite like this. What would you, how would you describe it? I think these by so thumb. I mean, it must have been a giant <laughs> home. This is huge. We think of wall sconces as being small yeah. little pockets of light. This is really but outside. But this is a wall sconce? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it may be a planter also. This hollow yes. part of here, oh, yes. but I envision this either in the lobby of a tremendous theater or in a hotel. And it lights up. Yes, oh, it's yes. got lights on, and I—that's what I see it as. Some place with on a grander scale. What is it made of? It's safe metal that's been painted, from what I can gather. It's been gilded. White metal that's been gilded. So you can see mm -hmm. some of the plating, the gilding. How is do you go about there. aging something like this and dating? Well, I mean, there's certainly. Um, if, if you want to age it, you can apply a patina, which, a fake mm -hmm. patina, but you want to know when it was made? made yes. Okay, by its style, I would say probably about the 1920s. It mm -hmm. has a very nouveau look and mm -hmm. very grand scale. 1920s through the 1940s, that very glamorous era when we were glamorous in our wear and, and glamorous in our homes. Weren't we, though? Oh, my. <laughs> this is not an item you see every day, so no. I imagine it's not no. an everyday price. No, I don't think it's an everyday price. I, I think it, it would start at 500 mm -hmm. and go up from there. I agree. How far mm -hmm. up? Can go to a thousand. It can go to a yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely, interesting piece. Is this going home to be on your wall? You're thinking about taking some offers? We'll definitely entertain offers and see how it goes. Thank you so much for being with You're us. Welcome. It was really if nice seeing you. Excuse us. We have another item to appraise in the rec sure. room. And our number to call is 212-802-0082 if you're interested in that wall sconce. And Jonathan is joining us. Hi, Jonathan. Good to Hi. see you. What do you collect? Um, marbles. <laughs> marbles? These are nice marbles. Where'd you get them? My cousin Paul. Yeah, how many marbles do you have? This is about 30, right? About 30? Hmm. Let's see what they're worth. Well, you have lots of different kinds of mm -hmm. marbles here, and Jonathan knows that I'm a marble collector too, so. This one, now these are swirls, okay? These swirl marbles are handmade, and they're made by taking several colored canes of glass and then breaking them off, and then, therefore, you get this little pontal mark, the scar on the end. This one is called a latticino core because it's got the ribbons on the outside and inside the core looks almost like lattice work. Are the swirl marbles more valuable than some of the other kinds? Any of the handmade ones are more mm -hmm. valuable than the, the newer ones. You've got a bunch of swirls here. Let's see, you've got two large ones. This one's a ribbon core. Mm -hmm. And these would sell probably for $100 or $125 a piece. Really? Yeah. Jonathan, you have any idea it was worth mm -hmm. that much? Nope. Nope. <laughs> 
Okay, then we, here's the next size of, you've got, let's see, two, four, six, seven of these, well, let's say six of the medium-sized swirls, and those generally sell for 40 or $50 a piece. I hope somebody's adding this up. <laughs> and then you have these peewees here. You have three of these real peewees. I think I left this one out of the medium ones. Three of the peewees, and peewees generally sell for about $25. Jerry, what do you think? I'm amazed because I know very little about marbles except that I played them and I know the clay ones because mm -hmm. as I was saying earlier, we used to make them. You make little round circles and mm -hmm. uh, balls and stick them in the oven. They fell apart on you, but it was a great, it was a lot of fun. For marble yeah. collectors, what would they be paying well, for Well, I'm trying like to add up. These are the clay ones. Some mm -hmm. of them are glazed and those are called mm -hmm. Bennington's. The unglazed ones are called clay and these would sell probably for the big ones for about $2 a piece and the little ones for a dollar a piece. I don't know. I hope somebody's been adding this up as we went along. You've got one little glass one here. Um, I would okay. probably say oh, 400 or so for the whole. 400 to 500 dollar yeah. range, even mm -hmm. possibly. I can see. Want to go, <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan? What do you think? You got a pretty valuable collection. Mm -hmm. Would you like to put it up for sale? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we're going to go back on out to Indiana and see what Tom has brought to be appraised. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the program. Hi. How are you? Very well, thank you. Tell us about your doll. Well, it's a Shirley Temple doll that my mother acquired in about 1936 or 1937, and she played with it quite often as a little girl, but it's, I think it's in excellent shape still. How nice that it stayed in the family. We'll be happy to appraise it for you. Well, we, I Pardon? can see, see it's a composition doll, but we need to know how big it is. It's kind of important, the size. Right. How large is it, Tom? Fifteen and a half inches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is a Shirley Temple doll. This is the one from the 30s, and it seems to be in very nice shape. It's not missing its shoes or socks, which are kind of important. The only thing it's missing is the tag. Um, the hair is certainly Shirley's. Is, can we see the mark on the back? You, you've anticipated us. <laughs> right? Yes, it ideal. says Ideal Toy ideal. Company. Mm -hmm. This is the real McCoy. Okay. And is that the original dress, do you think? That's one of yes. the original or dresses. dresses. There were mm -hmm. several. Um, can you tell us, is the body in as good a shape as the limbs that we can see? Is there any cracking on the body that we can't see? Uh, very little, just a couple little flakes, but it's in mm -hmm. really excellent shape, I think. Flakes we can go along with. That's yeah. really not a problem. Shirley Temple's mm -hmm. so popular then and still very yes. collectible today. Absolutely. Very collectible. And the, the only drawback to composition is that it does tend to deteriorate mm -hmm. and it's hard to mm -hmm. repair. Mm -hmm. This is in pretty decent shape. If it was absolutely mint, it would be $800. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably the way it is, more like four to 500 four to five. Okay. In that four to $500 range, were you interested in taking some offers? Sure am. We'll be happy to do that for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, on the show, we've always seen so many people come in with violins, and it says Stradivarius. Oh. Does it mean it's valuable, J.D.? Not necessarily, Claire. We're here with David Herman from East Meadow, New York, who uh, since 75 has been restoring and dealing violins. Now, D David, when someone brings you a violin, what's the first thing they ask you as a role? Well, usually they call me on the phone, and I usually find a whispering tone. And I usually have to say, Rip, what did you say? And they say, I have a Stradivarius in the family. <laughs> and when they finally bring it to me, I'll open the case. Uh -huh. And sometimes, uh, to my shock, I will see that it's a commercial instrument. And if the instrument has any sentimental value to the family, I always ascertain that first. Because there were about 1,200 Stradivariuses made. Right. And most of them are accounted Absolutely. for. And they're like over a million dollars, right? Correct. Wow. Up to two million. Wow. And okay. there are literally thousands of German factory instruments with the same exact label in them. Okay, well you would look at this and you would realize that it's not a Stradivarius and there would be some telltale signs that would show you that this is a reproduction, right? Well, the biggest telltale sign, just looking from the gestalt of the whole instrument, is the varnish. The color is wrong mm -hmm. and the antique shading is not real. Okay. For example, the wear marks or antique shading would be normally done by the hand being placed here. It's correct here. Mm -hmm. However, here there's no reason for that wear, and there should be wear at this point, and there is none. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at an old violin with, with real, the accurate shading, and you look here. This is a German violin that's not 300 years, but only about 100 years old, and already has what we can call natural shading from the shoulder, and from perhaps sitting in a case, and right over here you can see perspiration marks right into the wood. Mm -hmm. So just from looking at that, you can you can uh, date that a little bit. I can date that and tell you that it's um, an authentic instrument that has naturally been aged. Okay, and then there are also the arches of the, of the violin that that tell you something. What does it tell you? Well, the instrument in my hand 
is a, an exact replica of a Stradivari made by Thomas Batuka. And if you'll notice, the belly or the arching of the top of the instrument is flatter As than it is this on one. this 1762 Klotz instrument. Mm -hmm. And Stradivari did that in order to improve the projection of the instrument so mm -hmm. that it would be heard in a larger area. And if you flip it over, you can, you can see that same thing on the back. Yes, this, this is, is much flatter. This is flatter also, And this yes. one has more of an arch. Stradivarius made violins during what period? Uh, during the Baroque period, mm -hmm. uh, up until his a uh, the age of his death, which was uh, 93 years old at 1744. Okay. Now tell us about the F holes here. This is another thing that, that, that's a telltale sign. Well, in this exact replica, you'll notice that the Stradivarian F holes are longer and narrower. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the clots, this you'll notice... shorter and a little wider here. Wider. But it's, it's a slight difference, huh? But it, you can see a difference if you look more than once or twice. And also the notches to indicate that they are modeled after the letter F are also more deeply cut. Okay, now model. tell us too about this part of the instrument, the scroll. Well, the scroll is a thumbprint of the maker. And in the Baroque period, the scrolls uh, were on a shorter neck. Mm -hmm. With the advent of need for more projection, the necks had to be made longer for modern usage. And all of the Baroque instruments have the original scroll with a modern neck, and you can see the graft line where the original master scroll was grafted onto a longer and modern neck. Mm -hmm. Now, if the instrument you're showing me does not have this and has a long neck, it is a, usually a 20th century wow. violin. Okay, you have to have a very, very keen eye for this. So if you have a violin that maybe was handed down, or you know, maybe you, you just found it or bought it, what should you do? How should you, you get it expertly appraised? Well, you could call the uh, American Appraisers Association. They will direct you to a reputable dealer that will be in your town or city. Okay, David Herman, thank you very much My for pleasure. educating us thank about you. violins. Let's go out to Indianapolis, Indiana, where Joyce has an item she'd like to have appraised. Hi, I'm going to have my oak washstand appraised coming up next on Personal FX. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Tell us about your item. This here is a washstand that I inherited from my grandmother. Um, it looks a lot better than it was when I inherited it. It had seven <laughs> coats of paint that had to be stripped off before we could refinish it. Wow. Mm. Okay. Well, can... This is before we had indoor plumbing. Yes. This is what you <laughs> used. You'd put your pitcher and bowl up on the top. They'd put a potty, a commode underneath, and you cleaned yourself up and did what you had to do. In the morning, somebody came up and emptied everything out. And the reason these remain as really popular collectibles is because you can put them to use in a modern home. Mm. I have one that I use as a bedside table, mm -hmm. the nightstand. And they're well, wonderful in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. They're just wonderful furniture pieces. Uh, what's interesting about this is the handles and the decorative uh, findings and finishings. Did you find those someplace? Are those original to the piece? Those are not original okay. for the piece. The original okay. pieces were wooden, and I just went out and purchased these and put them on here. Nice They're choice. Beautiful, beautiful um, Could you selection. maybe pull out the drawer and turn it upside down for us so we can look at the uh, joinery? That would do a lot to help. It's, yeah. Oh, now, you does, a, really does it hurt that she replaced this. the handles? Well, that's what I was kind of coming to. This piece has been, what I, there's a term they use, it's called skin, when the piece has been so totally refinished that it's mm -hmm. almost like a brand new piece. Mm -hmm. And some quarters that hurts it, and some quarters it doesn't. But this is a handmade piece, mm -hmm. and so it's very valuable. I'm going to say three to five hundred dollars mm -hmm. for it. I'm about two fifty on it. Wow. Okay. So Joyce, we're hearing a spread of between two hundred and fifty and five hundred dollars. Are you going to hold on to it, or would you like to entertain some offers? I'm definitely going to hold on to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Don't blame her. She did a lovely job of refinishing it. <laughs> Let's turn to our mailbag. We have Eleanor on the line from Dana Point, California. Hi, Eleanor. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good to have you with us. You wrote us about a silver samovar. Please tell the audience about it. Well, my husband in inherited this from his grandmother, and we're very curious to know what it was used for. There is a lining inside the pitcher, so we assume it could have been used for hot or cold beverages. Mm -hmm. It consists of four pieces. A goblet, small container on the tray that could have held cookies, and a large pitcher that can be removed or may rest on two notches on the main tray. Eleanor, you also wrote us that it's Mark Parapoint uh, Manufacturing Company, which we yes. just saw a piece from there. That. Yeah. Uh, that's 
at the circle and it's marked quadruple plate. Let's appraise it for you and see what our appraisers It's got one more coat of so mm -hmm. silver than the last set we saw. And I believe that it's a wine set mm -hmm. because of the shape of the goblet and that the two little notches that hold the pot enable you to tip it without spilling it. And that it probably was for wine and biscuits or something. Mm -hmm. Very ornate, very or, or nouveau looking, very art nouveau looking. Very lovely. Mm -hmm. And about how much value would you say? Mm -hmm. Turn of the century, I say between two fifty and three hundred dollars. I agree. Mm -hmm. In that two fifty, three hundred dollar price range, Eleanor, would you like to put it up for sale? No, it's an heirloom. We're going to pass it down in the family. Good. 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 Thank you so much for sharing it with us and continue to enjoy it. Thank you. And when we come back, big bids. Da -da -da -da. Before we go, we have to thank David Herman from East Meadow, New York, for informing us about violins. Thank, thank you, you very much for joining us. Thank you. You have to have a very keen eye, so consult an expert. Right, David? True. Okay. Claire, let's get going with the big bids. Yes, and let's go back out to Indianapolis, because you want to let Nanette know for your Larry Bird cutout, Shirley from Ravenna, Ohio, would like it for $65. That, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and it got higher than the appraised value, too. Andy, for the sugar and cream, Lori from Sedalia, Missouri, is offering $350. I'll think about it. Thinking about it. Tracy, for your Smurf figures, Matthew from Key West, Florida, for all of them, would like it for $256.50. Okay, um, I'll think about it. Right. And Melissa, for your Weller Vaz, Diane from Trumbull, Connecticut, has bid $300. I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. about it. All right, and Mary, for your homemaker set, Kimber from Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania, is offering $275.50. I'll definitely think about it. <laughs> definitely thinking about it. Alicia, for your brass inkwell, Joan from Lakewood, Ohio, is offering $256. I'll think about it. Thinking about it. Have we sold anything yet? Not yet. Nancy, for your cigarette case, it's not from Louis Anderson. Carol from Oceanside, California, is offering $250. I think we'll sell it. So we have one, ladies and gentlemen. And Jonathan, for your marbles, Michelle from Livermore, California, is offering $350 for all of them. I'll think about it. Ooh. Thinking about it. Okay. And now let's go back out to Io Haynes and JD. Great, great segment today, Io. Thank you, and I want to say thank you to AJ also for being here. <laughs> JD, thank you for showing us your racing memorabilia. Thank We're finishing up the week in Fisher, Indiana, looking at percussion instruments, 1,000. <laughs> All right. Thank you very That's much. Fun. Thank you. It's a musical Jerry, show this week. Absolutely. Jerry Harrelson, and Judith Katz Schwartz, thanks for being our appraisers. To all of you in the apartment and at home, make the most of your day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.